Hello folks, welcome to another SACPA session. SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the, on the lands of the Blackfoot people in the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. And we, res and we pay respect to their past, present and future cultural, heritage, beliefs and relationship to the land. SACPA is committed um, to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. SACPA is very thankful for the continuing support we receive from the University of Lethbridge, Shaw Spotlight and the Lethbridge Herald. Today we're very happy to introduce um, Dr. Chris Burton. Chris, thank you very much for joining us today. Chris, Chris grew up in St. John's Newfoundland, taking his BA in History at Memorial University, followed by an MA from Carleton University in Ottawa. He worked in the Soviet Union during the Glasnost years, then studied with Sheila Fitzpatrick in the 1990s at the University of Chicago for his PhD. He is an associate professor at the, in history or of history at the University of Lethbridge and has been teaching Russian history there and modern European history more generally for the last 20 years. His research interests include the medical profession under Stalin, social policy in the Soviet Union, and the Soviet science of environmental health, including their understanding of air and water pollution. Thanks so much, Chris, for joining us today, and we very much look forward to your talk. Hmm. Well, thank you very much, Annalise. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thank you to SACPA uh, very much for the opportunity uh, to speak, although I wish I was speaking in happier times, and uh, thank you to everybody for coming up, uh, showing up to hear my talk. Uh, I have to uh, start with a, a couple of reservations. Uh, first of all, I had COVID recently, and I do have bouts of coughing. I have some water here, uh, but I may be, uh, I'll, I'll try to keep that under control. Uh, I also should emphasize I am, that I am a historian, uh, as Annalise said, not a political scientist. So I cannot provide a, a sophisticated analysis of what's going on in Ukraine uh, right now as a political scientist could, but I will, I will say obviously a lot about it. Uh, I'm also a specialist on Russia, not Ukraine. Uh, I have been to the Soviet Union and the former Soviet Union dozens of times. I think I've lost count. I, I think it's 57 now, but I'm not sure. Uh, but I usually uh, have been to Russia. Uh, the last time I was in Ukraine, I'm sorry to say, was in 1991, a very long time ago. Uh, although that was in Donbass, interestingly, and I can, I can talk about that if anyone's interested in that and talk about that in the Q&A afterwards. Uh, so my talk today is largely about uh, Russian attitudes and actions uh, with regard to Ukraine. So, Annalise, if you could uh, show the first slide, please, uh, if it's okay, it's, yeah, okay. So this is the first slide, just, uh, of course, the uh, uh, title of the talk. Um, so what I'm going to try to do today is cover a few related things. Uh, first of all, how could this have happened? How could, how could it be that Russia invaded Ukraine? This took uh, most people by surprise, most specialists by surprise, they didn't actually think that Russia would invade Ukraine. Um, and uh, to try to explain this, I'm going to say a little bit about uh, the Putin regime itself, uh, governance in the Putin regime. I'm going to talk about Russian attitudes towards Ukraine and Ukrainians, or the attitudes of some Russians towards Ukraine and Ukrainians, how these overlap with the um, uh, policy of the Putin regime. Um, I'll say a little bit about the long running Russian policy to NATO expansion and I'll briefly examine Russian claims to be fighting fascism. After that, <clears throat> I'll speculate a little on why the, the war happened when it did. Why did it happen uh, in start in February of 2022? Uh, I'll say a little bit about the war itself if I have time. Uh, and then I'll talk about the second phase of the war marked by a change in Russian war aims. Uh, but I'll mainly talk about the background to those war aims. So that's quite an ambitious agenda. I may not get through all of it, but we'll, we'll see how this goes. So I've given public talks in the past about uh, the politics of Putin, uh, and my summary was pretty dark, uh, but it was mostly about Putin operating in the world of electoral politics. So this was Putin uh, some, some years ago. Uh, his, Putin's advisors manipulated and distorted the world of electoral politics through what was known as managed democracy. Uh, 
a very smart public relations. One of the keys to Putin's success was that he had a brilliant public relations team, which seems to have sort of fallen by the wayside at this point. But in the early years, he certainly did. Rigged elections and so on. But the talk was still about electoral politics. Um, and I did not highlight earlier that he has always worked with the same few trusted confidants, dating back, first of all, to his time in St. Petersburg in the 1990s. So Dmitry Medvedev, for example, uh, who uh, ruled in tandem with Putin, uh, Medvedev, uh, uh, of course, uh, serving a term as president, although Putin was really uh, running the government. <coughs> He's the most famous example of this group from St. Petersburg. But there's an even o older group of confidants that date back to Putin's early years in the KGB in the 1970s. So we have the St. Petersburg group from the 1990s there with Putin now, uh, but then this older group from the security apparatus that go back to the 1970s. Uh, these are now Putin's security chiefs. Uh, Nikolai Petrushev, the former KGB officer who Putin met in the 1970s, now the head of Putin's Security Council, very important person. Uh, and he probably approved the assassination of Alexander Litvinenko, if you remember the whole episode with the polonium tea. It was probably Petrushev who organized that. The head of the FSB, what used to be the KGB, now the FSB, Alexander Bortnikov, Putin has also known since the 1970s. And of course, um, uh, well, there's also Sergei Norishkin, head of foreign intelligence, a conspiracy theorist. Uh, and then, of course, Sergei Shoigu, who we see a lot these days, uh, the, the defense minister. Uh, Putin is particularly close to Sergei Shoigu. Uh, they've gone hunting and fishing together for decades. So uh, parallels have been drawn between these men and the gerontocracy of Brezhnev. If you remember Brezhnev's uh, rule, uh, some of you may. Um, the people with Brezhnev, Brezhnev himself growing increasingly old, uh, the people around him, people like Ustinov, the defense chief, Suslov, the ideologue, and so on, they're all old men. And something similar seems to have happened with Putin as well. Um, and we have a lot of talk of, about echo chambers these days, right? People in their echo chambers because of social media. Uh, these increasingly old men uh, consist of Putin's echo chamber, a few trusted confidants whom he has worked closely with for more than 40 years, more than 40 years, and they share much of the same outlook with him. Their views are mutually reinforcing. Uh, and the walls of this echo chamber are getting thicker. They have been getting thicker. Uh, they've been reinforced since um, uh, the crackdown on the opposition in 2012. Um, so a lot of the opposition arrested and so on in 2012. The last decade or so, um, uh, this, this group of people has become increasingly self-referential. Um, if you could show slide number two, please, uh, Annalise. Okay, slide number two. Uh, so, criminology, who's standing next to whom? So, uh, Putin has become in increasingly isolated, and in some ways we see a throwback to criminology, which unfortunately is what I have to do some of the time. Uh, so, if you remember uh, back in the Soviet period, uh, we had so little information about the leadership. So, people would scrutinize Lenin's mausoleum very closely to see who was standing next to whom. And we have a bit of a version of that now. So if we could uh, now move to slide number three, uh, here, here's the current version of criminology. Uh, so uh, we're, we're now looking at, of course, who Putin is meeting. Uh, and um, uh, from the beginning of Putin's presidency in the, uh, the early 2000s, <coughs> um, Television, uh, the, the, the Russian television news was increasingly taken over by the state, uh, and they would show Putin almost every day uh, at his desk in his office, uh, frequently berating a subordinate, right? So this is Shoigu here, Sergei, Sergei Shoigu, the defense minister. So Putin and the Shoigu looking very serious. And very often you, you'd have Putin uh, playing the dominant male, uh, berating his minister from across the desk. Uh, if you could show slide number four now, please, uh, Annalise. So, yes, criminology at its finest. So what we've been reduced to doing is uh, trying to tease out the significance of the distance between Putin and his subordinates, right? So uh, one meter difference in you know, 2011, uh, and now it's six meters between Putin and his subordinates. Um, uh, so uh, you know, criminologists study this sort of thing. It's slightly ridiculous. Oh, it's more than slightly ridiculous. Um, but um, the more general point is the literal and figurative distancing of Putin, right, from, from other people. M most of this has to do with the COVID, right? This is um, 
uh, Putin's um, defense against COVID. Um, but um, uh, it also has it also uh, has something to do with Putin's fear of poisoning. For some reason, Putin has a fear of poisoning. We can all speculate as to why that might be. He rarely eats in public now. Um, but it also, again, highlights his isolation. Uh, he is detached. Um, and these this detachment, these chickens have come home to roost uh, with uh, the war, the, the, the early days of the war. Uh, his own advisors practiced deception on him, telling him that it was going much better than it, than it actually was. Um, so uh, it's one of the factors that I wanted to start with, uh, slightly strange, uh, the self-reinforcing echo chamber of the Russian conservative elite that Putin operates within. Um, another factor I uh, want to look at is the problematic attitude of some Russians towards Ukraine and Ukrainians. And I emphasize here some Russians. Uh, many Russians do not hold the attitudes that I'm about to uh, talk about. But I'm going to focus on these on these particular attitudes because they are uh, they also inform Putin's view of Ukraine. And uh, some Russians have a problematic attitude towards Ukraine and Ukrainians. This was really brought home to me in 2014 uh, with the invasion of Crimea. And I was listening to, of all things, CBC, the Sunday edition hosted by Michael Enright. Um, and he was interviewing a virtuoso Russian pianist who was touring Canada. Uh, and the interview was right after the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. <clears throat> and most of the interview was about Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff and so on. But at some point, the subject of Ukraine came up, and I was absolutely staggered at what I was hearing because we had this very polished, brilliant, sophisticated, sophisticated pianist talking about playing Rachmaninoff and so on, and suddenly she just unleashed a stream of abuse towards Ukraine. Uh, it was extremely scatological. It just made my jaw drop as I heard it, uh, and uh, it really brought home to me the attitude that some Russians have towards Ukraine. Michael Enright himself was heavily criticized for not challenging her about this, but it really emphasized to me the, uh, the seriousness of the problem. Uh, and there's a long history to the uh, troubling attitude of some Russians towards Ukraine. Uh, and I'm now going to talk about that history. Uh, so we're going to actually slip, uh, skip slide number five and please go to slide number six. Uh, so this is the uh, medieval Cuban Rus. Um, so uh, the long history of the troubling attitude of some Russians to Ukraine is lodged in the common origin story of both Ukraine and Russia. Remembering I am a historian, of course, we have to go deep into history here. Um, both Russia and Ukraine share an inheritance from the very first East Slavic state, uh, Kiev Rus, the largest political entity in medieval uh, uh, Europe. It was bigger than the Holy Roman Empire, for example. And it also had one of the largest cities in Europe. Uh, if we could go to slide number seven. Here we go, slide number seven. Uh, so here is um, uh, a reconstruction of one of the most famous uh, buildings of medieval Kiev. Uh, medieval Kiev had a very vibrant and original culture and society. Um, and interestingly, uh, in the 1980s, uh, under the Soviet Union, they reconstructed the Great Gates of Kiev, right? So here we go, it's, a fan it's, a, it's a, an enormous object. Uh, very, it's magnificent. Please try to ignore the Pepsi stand in the front, uh, in the foreground. Uh, so well, that does bring home that this is a modern uh, 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 depiction. Uh, we actually have no idea what the Great Gates of Kiev look like. Um, so this is just a modern reconstruction. Uh, and that is significant happening in the late 1980s as the Soviet Union was experiencing a crisis of identity, reaching back to the medieval period. Um, and this reconstruction of the Great Gates of Kiev and other parts of Kiev, part of uh, uh, an attempt in the late, late Soviet period to uh, reinforce national identities, right? Um, as long as Kiev, as long as Kiev remained part of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union, it was easy for Russians to prevent to present Kiev Rus, the very first Slavic state, East Slavic state as their historical legacy. But when the Soviet, the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, this presented a direct threat to Russian historical mythology. Uh, so the ancient capital of the Russian, uh, of the East Slavic state, of the Russian state, was now in a different uh, country. Uh, so this posed a direct threat to 
uh, Russian historical identity. So if we can shift to uh, slide number eight now, something very interesting happened in the 1990s. To try to cope with this under, um, uh, under Yeltsin, especially under Putin, Russia tried to create a different historical legacy by intensifying archaeological explorations in the Russian north, for example, around Novgorod. So they tried to create a completely different uh, or, or a somewhat different origin story, emphasizing that the origins of Russia were actually in the Russian north, not in Kiev. So a different origin story from the 1990s onward, but Kiev has not been forgotten. So back to medieval history very briefly, Kiev Rus was conquered by the, uh, the Mongols, <coughs> the Tatars in 1240, and uh, this led to the separation of Ukrainians from, from Russians for several hundred years. Um, so uh, people living in what is now Ukraine, people in, living in what is now Russia, were separated from each other. There was, there was very little contact, and culturally uh, they grew apart somewhat, linguistically as well. If we could move to the next slide, and that's slide number nine. So um, they were uh, finally brought back together again by the Treaty of Pereyaslav in 1654, so several hundred years after uh, the Mongol invasion. This was a result of the politics of Cossack chieftains, and you can see the Cossacks here, who decided that a relationship with Russia was, was preferable to a relationship with Poland or Turkey. So uh, Russia uh, sort of increasingly taking sovereignty over uh, what would become Ukraine. Uh, the Treaty of Pereyaslav was presented by Russian rulers and intellectuals as a restoration of ancient historical ties. The Cossacks themselves didn't see it that way, but the Russians did. And very importantly, any later attempt by Ukrainians to break away was understood as an attack on Russian identity itself. Even more, uh, Ukrainians uh, to these Russians, these Russian rulers and intellectuals, lacked a national identity of their own. Uh, and so Russians became... Uh, the, the ruling elite intellectuals became hypersensitive to Ukrainian self-expression, Ukrainian self-expression as Ukrainian. And this hypersensitivity goes all the way back to 15, 15, 1654, right? So this uh, has persisted for hundreds of years, 1654. The Cossack territory was annexed by the Russian Tsar in six, 1764, uh, corresponding uh, to the uh, territory of modern Ukraine, but it was referred to from, 16, from 1764 onward as Little Russia, Little Russia, um, uh, which is uh, quite condescending, of course. Uh, and also Russians themselves used the term Little Russians to put down Ukrainians. Uh, so this was going on from the 18th century onward. Little Russians, a term that was used pejoratively, it indicated people that were mainly peasants that had a lower level of culture and they did not speak a distinct language. They spoke a dialect of Russians, according to the Russians themselves. The Russian Empire did not recognize Ukrainian as a distinct language uh, or Ukrainians as a distinct people. And this discrimination continued right through the Tsarist period, all the way up to the revolution, all the way up to the top. So Tsar Nicholas II, uh, the last Tsar of Russia before the revolution uh, in 1917, last ruler of the Romanovs, he apparently said, quote, there is no Ukrainian language, just illiterate peasant speaking little Russians. So there is no Ukrainian language, just illiterate peasant speaking little Russians. So that came from the Tsar himself, this very condescending attitude towards Ukrainians. Okay, if we could move to the next slide, please. All right, so moving into the Soviet period, the situation uh, in the years just after the Bolshevik revolution was extremely unusual. Uh, before falling into something more predictable under Stalin in the 1930s uh, and afterwards. Lenin and the other Bolshevik leaders thought of mo modern nationalism as something negative, essentially middle class, bourgeois, uh, and reactionary. Um, just checking my wire here. Okay. Uh, but they also recognized nationalism as very powerful. Uh, so they decided to co-opt nationalism. Uh, while continuing to promote working class internationalism. So interestingly, the Soviet Union in the 1920s, the Soviet Union in the 1920s was the very first country in the world to establish affirmative action. Very first country in the world to establish affirmative action. And this was for national minorities. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, Ukraine and Ukrainians in the 1920s were major beneficiaries of this. However, by 1932, Stalin happened. 
uh, and uh, Stalin changed national nationalities policy in a major way. Uh, communists who were Ukrainian nationalists were now seen as a dangerous threat and they were purged. Um, and then we have the greatest disaster in Ukrainian history, the Holodomor, the uh, famine. Millions of Ukrainian farmers and their families denied the fruit to survive. Uh, so uh, a, a very sharp change in the early 1930s under Stalin. Stalinism also saw a resurgence of Russian nationalism in the 1930s and after. <clears throat> Ukrainization, so encouraging a Ukrainian identity, was not completely ad abandoned, but it took second place to Russification, to Russian nationalism. So if we could look at the next slide, please. So here we go. Um, uh, after the 1930s, uh, so uh, there was a, well, there was another famine in 1946, 1947. But uh, generally, uh, relations towards Ukrainians were not as abusive as uh, during the 1930s. But just as problematically, uh, re relations between Russians and Ukrainians became framed as fraternal, but increasingly with Russians as the elder brother and you, uh, a benefit to the Ukrainian younger brothers. So uh, a lot of emphasis on the fraternity of Russians and Ukrainians, but uh, this was condescending at best, right, with the Russians as the elder brother. So Russians uh, having difficulty accepting Ukraine as a, as a distinct country um, uh, and Ukrainians as a distinct people. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, right after the collapse, and we know this from public opinion surveys, uh, the majority of Russians did not recognize Ukraine as an equal partner with Russia. This was after Ukraine uh, uh, had already declared its independence as an independent country. Majority of Russians did not recognize Ukraine as an equal partner with Russia. Few Russians denied that Georgians are Georgian, Estonians are Estonian, and even Chechens are Chechen. But many Russians questioned the very existence of Ukrainians. So there was this special and unfortunate uh, attitude towards Ukrainians. Uh, many Russians looked at Ukraine as something artificial that would be reunited with Russia. And they still considered Ukrainian as a Russian dialect. Um, and there's a British journalist, Anna Reid, who, who noted that the very closeness of Ukrainian and, and Russian culture, the very subtlety of the differences, but, uh, the differences between them is an irritation. Because Ukrainian and Russian are, the culture are quite similar, the languages are quite, uh, quite similar, this is in itself a problem. This is a broader characteristic of Russian history, broader characteristic of Russian history. Those who are closest to Russians in identity in some way are more likely to be repressed. Um, and we can look at many, many different areas of Russian history to see this. For example, over most of the Tsarist period, up until about 1870, and a lot of people don't realize this, uh, the Tsars were relatively tolerant. They're relatively tolerant of religious believers who are not Russian Orthodox. So the religious practices of Lutherans, Catholics, Muslims usually were left alone as long as the Lutherans, Catholics, and Muslims were loyal to the Tsar. All believers in Dukabors, however, all believers in Dukabors were treated much more harshly because they were breakaway sects from Russian Orthodoxy, right? Because they were much more similar to Russian Orthodoxy. They were much more similar to the religion of the state than other religions. If we look at the Soviet period, look at the political opposition to Stalin. It's the Trotskyists the Trotskyists who were repressed most harshly of all the political opponents of Stalinism. And my apologies to any Trotskyists who may be listening uh, in the audience, uh, but I think it's because Trotskyism was similar to Stalinism. It presented the greatest threat politically, right? And this is similar again for Ukrainians. Uh, so it's, in, in, in Russian history, it's groups who tend to be the most similar to Russians but aren't Russians who tend, who, who tend to be repressed, right, for political reasons, religious reasons, whatever. Because Ukrainians are culturally and politically, politically similar to Russians, uh, their success in building their democracy since 1991 poses a special threat to the Putin regime. Um, so in each case, whether in religious belief, political ideology, or language and culture, it's the very similarity that provokes a sharp reaction from Russian authorities. They are especially threatening uh, for those reasons. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, all right, so I'll mention a couple of other factors here and I won't go into them in as much detail. Again, I'm not a political historian. I'm not a, a political scientist, I'm a historian. Uh, the denial of by many Russians of Ukrainian as a national identity uh, is linked to 
Putin's initial objective in the current war to dismantle Ukraine as an independent state. So he had this very ambitious objective to dismantle Ukraine as an independent state. Uh, he gave an alarming speech before the war that Ukraine does not have a history as a distinct state and by implication does not deserve to exist as such. Add to this, the idea in the early days, the early weeks of the war was to seize Kiev, seize it in the opening days of the, of the invasion. We know that they were planning to uh, march down the Khrushchev, the main street of Kiev within days of the invasion. Kiev is the key to the problem of identity for Russians as much as for Ukrainians. Uh, so this was uh, the objective. I want to briefly discuss two other causes of the, of the war. Uh, the first is the Russian concern of the expansion of NATO and that Ukraine may be about to join. There's nothing new about this. Uh, instead, uh, what is noteworthy is the consistency of the Russian concern. They have genuinely been worried about this from before the breakup of the Soviet Union. So Gorbachev was bringing this up with uh, George Bush Sr., right, back in 1990 and earlier. So from Gorbachev to Yeltsin and then to Putin, uh, there's nothing new about this. A Russian concern uh, about NATO expansion. And here, ironically, Finlandization is a precedent, with Finland taking an official position of neutrality with friendly relations with the Soviet Union all the way from 1945 to now, although ironically that is about to end, right? We just heard today that the Finnish government uh, has recommended joining NATO. But uh, guiding the Soviet policy for many years is the idea of Finlandization. And this is what they wanted for Ukraine. Putin has been calling for a new Yalta for years, a new summit meeting, which would establish uh, neutral buffer states between Russia and the West. Um, and the, in his view, the, the right of Ukrainians themselves to determine their own foreign, foreign policy, which is something that I think most of us uh, would agree with, uh, is simply not recognized by Putin and the security establishment in Moscow. To Putin, Petrushev, uh, and others, the security needs of Russia override this. Whatever else you can say about the Russians, they have been entirely consistent on this uh, for decades. Since this came up at the last talk I gave uh, on Ukraine, and I suspect it's going to come up in question and answer afterwards, I'll speak briefly about Russian claims to have launched the war to fight fascism. Um, so, and uh, to most of us, of course, this seems ridiculous. The most obvious, uh, uh, of course, counter argument is that Zelensky is Jewish, uh, the Ukrainian president. But um, uh, it is true that 20th century Ukraine had, had an association with ultra right wing nationalism, the Stefan Bandera, uh, collaboration with the Nazis, although Bandera was also imprisoned by the Nazis. Um, ultra right wing groups have had a presence in post 1991 Ukraine and Ukrainian politics. There's a very right wing party, Svoboda, for example. In the current war, the Azov Battalion gets a lot of press, with 10% or more of its soldiers neo-Nazis. Uh, so there are elements here um, uh, of, uh, there's something there, but this is enormously disproportionate. Uh, the Ukrainian army has many battalions. I have no idea how many battalions the Ukrainian army has, but more than 100. Um, Azov is just one of them, and it has sort of attached to itself, uh, it attached itself to the army. Support for the right-wing Svoboda party has slipped from about 10% in 2012 to under 5% in the 2017 elections to about 2% in the 2019 uh, elections. Russian propaganda about fighting fascism should be understood as largely that. The evidence from before the war, at least, was that few Ukrainians embraced such beliefs uh, and were increasingly moving away from them. Now, I, I, I believe I'm running out of time. I want to, yeah, five minutes, okay. I'm gonna speak briefly uh, as to the question about why the invasion happened when it did. Um, and um, one might ask, why didn't the Russians invade earlier or why didn't they wait? Um, and I'm going to suggest a couple of alternate explanations which you may not have heard before. If we go to slide number 14, please. <coughs> so slide 14. I think that uh, the NATO withdrawal from Afghanistan last summer played a role in the timing of the Russian invasion. Uh, we know that the Russian military built up before the invasion in February was slow, taking many months, but it started shortly after the West left Afghanistan. And military collapse in Afghanistan in very general terms carries special significance for Russians, especially those of Putin's generation. The defeat of the Red Army in Afghanistan in the 1980s was a major cause of the collapse of the Soviet Union. 
And I think, I think that Putin and his confidants, his echo chamber, read too much into the NATO withdrawal from Afghanistan in the summer of 2021. They thought they had caught the United States and its allies in a moment of particular weakness. And they did not think that NATO would do anything substantial to help Ukraine. And here, Putin also had the president of Georgia in 2008 uh, in, very much in mind. At that point, Condoleezza Rice, the U.S. Secretary of State, uh, had told uh, the Georgian president, uh, Saakashvili, that the West would stand by its friends. And she probably never meant that the United States would intervene militarily to help Georgia. Uh, but, Port, but Putin thought she did mean this. Putin actually has a very poor understanding of the West and the United States. Putin thought she did mean this. And when the United States did not intervene militarily uh, in Georgia in 2008, um, well, the security establishment in Moscow was bracing itself for some sort of military confrontation in 2008. This didn't, this didn't happen. Uh, and uh, Putin and the others overread that. They read too much into it. Finally, I'll uh, mention another big reason for the Russians invading when they did, which you may not have heard of before. Maybe you have. If we advance to the next slide, please. And this is the hydropolitics, the hydropolitics of, uh, of, of the war. Um, uh, I think another reason for the Russians invading when they did is the failure to secure Crimea with regard to its water supply. Uh, the interior of the Crimean, Crimean Peninsula is semi-desert, like Lethbridge, right? If you think of the country around Lethbridge, uh, if you get away from the coast in Crimea, it's like that. To fix this, if we can move to the next slide. Um, oh, no, actually, stay on this slide. Stay on slide 15. My apologies. <laughs> okay. To fix this, the Soviet Union built the North Crimean Canal starting in the late 1950s. After it was completed, the canal provided 85 percent, 85 percent of the fresh water supply for the Crimea. Uh, the population and agriculture of Crimea swelled uh, as a result. Uh, so now we can go to slide 16, and I promise, Annalise, I will soon, soon stop, okay? Slide 16. I'll stop after the hydropolitics, okay? So in 2014, after the Russian invasion, not surprisingly, the Russians dammed the canal. Uh, so it was one of the few ways the Ukrainians could put pressure on the Russians, but it was very effective. They suddenly stopped 85% of the fresh water supply to the Crimea. One wonders why the Russians didn't consider this before they invaded, but apparently they didn't. Uh, so uh, this seems to have taken by, them by surprise. The lack of, uh, if we could go to uh, slide 17, so here is the canal now, or in recent years, uh, the lack of water made the interior of the Crimea much less habitable. People started to leave, the farming shriveled up, and the occupation of the Crimea became tremendously expensive, largely because of the water supply. The first five years of occupying Crimea cost Russia roughly 25 billion, 23 billion U.S. dollars, 23 billion U.S. dollars, the equivalent of three years of the entire Russian state expenditure on health care. Uh, and from satellite images, we know that the desertification of Crimea became dramatically worse from 2018 onwards. So many Crimeans were limited to fresh water three hours in the morning and three hours at night. The water supply became a huge challenge for the Russians. It is no coincidence that almost the first thing they did, and I'm about to stop Annalise, I promise, uh, the, the almost the very first thing they did uh, in February 2022 was they blew up the Ukrainian dam uh, and they took Kherson, right? The very first sizable Ukrainian city they took was Kherson, which is anchors one end of the North Crimean Canal. So I believe I should probably stop here uh, on the hydropolitics of the war. There are, of course, many other reasons for the Russian uh, invasion. Uh, and if Annalise is happy with my stopping here, I will stop and uh, we'll go to question and answer. Thank you very much for bearing with me. Well, it's, it's amazing how much you managed to get into a half hour. Like, ah. wow. <laughs> Thanks. Um, very informative uh, presentation. Thanks very much. I'm going to go right to the question and answer here. Um, okay. Ian Hurdle has the first question. There's, okay. There seems to be a continuum of Russian regime ruthlessness. Nerve gas and radioactive poisoning and bombing of Moscow apartments to blame on Chechens where they seem to have no limit. Do you have a comment, please? Oh, wow. What a wonderful question. They seem to have no limit. Um, 
Wow, yes. Uh, well, I mean, one of the things I was going to cover in my presentation, which turns out to be about, about twice as long as it should have been, uh, was I was going to uh, talk about the similarities between the war in Syria and the war in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, the, the, as I think we all know, uh, a lot of the tactics the Russians are using in Ukraine were developed in Syria. Um, uh, so um, the uh, what's going on in Mariupol now in 2022 is very similar to what happened in Aleppo in 2016. Um, so uh, do I have a, I, 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 I won't go into the specific tactics being used, but uh, you know, we're all familiar with many of them. Um, yeah, the use of indiscriminate weapons, cluster bombs, uh, oxygen sucking bombs, they, which they use hundreds of times in Syria. Um, I, I would say that they seem to be showing a little more restraint in Ukraine than they did in Syria, although the tactics are the same, right? Um, uh, and of course, Mariupol is, is a big exception there. Um, but uh, yes, there seem to be no limits to the brutality. Uh, as uh, as Ian is saying, a lot of this has to do with the domination of the top of the Russian state by people from the former KGB, from the FSB. As I explained, it's it's Putin, but it's also Petrushev, his top advisor, who we're pretty sure uh, was the one who approved the polonium T, uh, the use of polonium T uh, against Litvinenko. Um, so I think part of the answer to Ian's question is the domination of the FSB and people from the FSB at, right at the top of the Russian state. They are trained to use any and all means uh, possible to achieve particular objectives. Um, the ruthless and also rather clumsy, right? Um, because they succeeded in poisoning Litvinenko. They succeeded in losing in using Novichok in London, but we know all about it. And we know, you know, we know what they did in Syria. We know what they're doing in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, they just seem to carry on, right? Um, so, uh, yes, it's ruthless. It's also clumsy. Uh, and um, they have little care for public opinion at this point, right? Um, there are many, many Russians who oppose the war, <coughs> oppose Putin's tactics, uh, but there is still enough support within Russia uh, that they can carry on with this. And of course, um, I'm, I'm giving a very rambling answer here. The state control of the media is really important here too. Uh, so the Russian state controls all television, for example, and many, many streaming services. And that's really important in um, um, preventing uh, many Russians from uh, from knowing what's what's really going on, what, what the Russian army is doing. So that was a long and rambling answer. I hope I can give more concise answers to, to other questions, but th thank you for the question, Ian. Our next question comes from Lori Schultz. In an, in an article, Fiona Hill said, w, World War III began in 2014 with the annexation of the Crimea. Um, comments, please. <laughs> I love these questions. They're enormous. I have endless respect for Fiona Hill, right? And I have to... Uh, um, uh, so, I mean, she's, um, as many of you know, or probably all of you know, she was a high-level official in the Trump administration, uh, and um, tried to rein in Trump, uh, which is almost impossible to do. Uh, she's a, a, a brilliant uh, expert on uh, Russia and the Soviet Union. And yes, uh, Putin has years ago decided that the West, the NATO, are the enemy. Uh, and in a sense, he has been using non-conventional warfare for years. I think this is Fiona Hill's point as well, since at least 2014, if not before. Uh, so, for example, the Russian interference in the American presidential campaign would be a kind of non-conventional warfare. So, yes, you can make an argument, as she has done, that World War III started years ago. The Russians have been waging non-conventional warfare against the West and other places for years now. Uh, and in a sense, um, uh, the, the current war in Ukraine is, is an escalation of that. Uh, Putin's motivations for invading Ukraine, uh, he sees the Ukraine as a Western proxy. Um, as I said, he has actually quite limited understanding about Canada, the America, and so on. He sees uh, Ukraine as a Western proxy, so in a sense, he thinks he's fighting against the West already by by invading Ukraine. Do you do you think the response from the West towards this escalation of aggression is adequate? Uh, is that your question, Annalise? Or, it sure uh... is. <laughs> Sorry, okay, all right. that's, that's, a moderator, that's a moderator privilege. Yes, 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, we're, uh, I share the horror uh, that most people feel uh, about what Russia has done invading a sovereign country, the atrocities that Russian soldiers are carrying out. It's a very lopsided war. So the Russians can send rockets and missiles with impunity into Ukrainian cities. The Ukrainians are not doing the same thing back to the Russians, right? So the Russians are terrorizing Russian civilian populations. The Ukrainians um, either have, do not have the capability or they're, they're just not using it. Uh, so it's very one-sided. Um, and um, Putin at this point is not willing to negotiate, it seems. Um, there is also the fear of escalation, um, and uh, which is, you know, obviously uh, a, a, an enormous consideration. Um, we have provided Ukraine with many weapons. They are fighting very effectively, uh, much more effectively than the Russians. Uh, and this seems like an adequ adequate response for many people. Uh, there are also, of course, many foreign volunteers in Ukraine fighting with varying degrees of effectiveness, many of them not fighting very effectively at all. Um, so non-Ukrainians are in there fighting with Ukrainians. Uh, we do have to be very careful about escalation, I think. Um, and uh, we, uh, I think most of us would agree Ukraine should be sovereign. Ukrainians should have the freedom to decide um, uh, you know, whether to join the European Union and so forth. Uh, but um, we have to be careful that we don't escalate into uh, a real um, uh, high intensity conflict inv involving many, many countries. So uh, that is my uh, rather cautious answer to your, uh, your bold question. I expected bold questions from Annalise, so. <laughs> okay, our uh, next question comes from um, Maureen Hawkins. Ah, okay. Who replaced the Ukrainians who died in the Holodorum? Were ethnic Russians planted in their stead? I, okay, I, very good question. I don't know, I don't think so, because um, uh, possibly in the Donbass area, although that's not, not a major grain producing area, if I remember correctly. Um, the famine occurred mainly in the food producing areas, uh, and it affected many, many Russians died uh, in the famine as well, uh, also Jews. Um, and it wasn't limited to just ethnic Ukrainian areas. So ethnic Russian areas, if they grew a lot of wheat, for example, in the Volga, uh, along the mid Volga, many, many ethnic Russians died as well. Um, so um, I, I'm not aware of any large scale resettlement because of the famine, um, uh, but I, I, I could be mistaken. Um, so, I mean, certainly there was resettlement uh, in other areas later on, for example, in Crimea, after the Crimean Tatars were deported by Stalin, right? So um, uh, the Soviet Union certainly did do that. Uh, I'm not aware of large scale resettlement because of the, uh, the famine in the early 1930s in Ukraine. Our next question comes from, actually, uh, it's a comment. Uh, okay. Ian McLaughlin, very, ah. very informative talk. Thank you so much, Chris, from Ian and Diane. Um, Mark Gödel, are the Russians really prepared or intent on repairing all of their collateral damage that they are inflicting on Ukraine once they win? I haven't seen anything on that yet, but I would assume that if the Russian, well, the, the air, if the Russians remain in occupation of places like Mariupol, um, they will certainly want to rebuild Mariupol because it's such an important port and industrial center. Uh, they might even rebuild the, the steelworks, I don't know. Um, uh, if the question is about whether the Russians would be uh, prepared to rebuild uh, Ukraine uh, in areas they, they didn't occupy, I mean, that obviously the current government wouldn't be willing to do that. Uh, if there's a regime change, uh, another Russian government might be willing to help rebuild parts of Ukraine that Russia has just rocketed from, from long distances. So, but no, the, the current, current government wouldn't agree to that. The next question is uh, from Maureen Hawkins. Are you okay. are Ukrainians more ethically tartan and Cossack than the Russians? Okay, are Ukrainians more ethnically Tatar uh, and Cossack than the Russians? Uh, okay, the Cossacks and the Tatars, that's two different things. So the Tatars, um, okay, a long history of the uh, uh, different peoples of Russia. So when the Mongols arrived in 20, 20, 1240, 
80% of Mongol horde was actually Tatar. The Tatars are Turks. Um, and um, the Tatars settled in various parts of the Russian steppe. Uh, most of them settled uh, in um, areas outside of Ukraine. Uh, some of them settled in Crimea. So we have the Crimean Tatars, right? And there would have been some intermarriage between the Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians, uh, more so between the Russian population and the Tatars, because there are many more Tatars uh, in what is now the Russian Federation. So the answer to Maureen's question is that um, there would be more um, more mixing of the Tatar and Russian population than the Ukrainian and Tatar population. Our next question comes from Henning Mandel. Please, okay. please comment on the potential influence of the large number of Russian-Ukrainian intermarriages and the Russian population in the Ukraine on Putin's decision to invade the Ukraine? Oh, what a great question. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, national identity. It's a very fluid thing, actually. So one of the big reasons for Russian intervention or invasion in Ukraine, this was a big reason in 2014. And interestingly, with the failure of the first phase of the war, <coughs> the Russians are falling back on this. One of the big reasons is the large number of Russians who, who live in Ukraine. And this is something that has, has been um, in Putin's mind for a very long time. Already in the 1990s, before he became president, as long back, as far back as 1994, he was pointing out that 25 million Russians live outside the borders of Russia. Uh, and this has become a major uh, driving force of his regime, the idea that Russia should protect the Russian diaspora, right? Russians living outside the borders of Russia. So this has, was a major reason for uh, the uh, invasion of 2014 uh, in the Donbass, where there are more Russians than Ukrainians. And Putin... Putin's government is now falling back on this with the failure of the first phase of the war. So we have the second phase of the war where it's now more about protecting ethnic Russians. But this is really complicated, and you're probably going to regret asking this question because I can go on and on for hours about this. But the national identity in Ukraine is much more complicated than that. You already asked the question about the intermarriage between uh, national, uh, ethnic Russians and ethnic Ukrainians. Who is an ethnic Russian? Who is an ethnic Ukrainian? It's on the passport but you may consider that you have a different national identity. And actually, so often it's done by the first language that you speak. Many Russian speakers in Ukraine consider themselves to be Ukrainian, and that proportion has vastly increased since 2014. So many people who were identified as Russian in 2014 became much less interested in, in identifying as Russian after 2014. They really hated what the Russian government had done, and they now identify as Ukrainian. So who is a Russian, who is a Ukrainian? It's really, really blurry. And it, it often depends on the choice of the person themselves. So culturally, they may be Russian. Linguistically, they may be Russian. But they may now identify as Ukrainian. And that has increasingly, that tendency has increased a great deal since 2014. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, but, but that makes me sort of, what wasn't there in Chechnya? Wasn't there this whole thing about handing out pa passports? Um, okay. Russian I'm, Russian passports and getting free to Chechnya. Yeah. Uh, yes, I I don't remember the specifics, but yes. Um, uh, so Russians have internal passports as well as external passports, uh, and um, uh, in the past you've actually had had to have a, an internal passport to travel outside your home city. Um, and um, you, you'll often see, probably at the moment, I haven't been to Russia since 2018, but you'll see Minister of the Interior troops checking people's passports as they come off the metro in, in Moscow and so on. So having a passport is a really big deal to travel inside of Russia as well as outside of Russia. And I don't remember the deal with the Chechens, but probably uh, this was used as some sort of bribe or threat to the Chechen population. You behave uh, or you won't be given passports and you won't be able to travel outside of Grozny or wherever. Many, many Chechens live and work outside of Chechnya. They need to uh, for economic reasons. So, I, you know, I, I, I don't know the specifics of your question, Annalise, but I'm guessing that uh, the, the issuing of passports or the non-issuing of passports was held as a threat over the Chechens uh, to make sure that they um, don't engage in anti-Russian activities. Okay. Our next question is from... Um, Maureen Hawkins, is there any ah. is there any likelihood that, as rumor has it, 
Putin is extremely terminally ill. Right. Yes, there are rumors. And some people in the West know the truth about this or know a lot more about this than I do. Uh, so members of the American Congress have said that there's something going on there medically with Putin, but they won't tell us what it is, right? It's highly confidential. Uh, people have looked at Putin. They've noticed his puffy face. They believe he may be on steroids, which is alarming in itself. Um, so, um, yes, there are strong rumors. There is some visual evidence that he's not well. Uh, members of the American Congress have intelligence on this, which they're not sharing with us. Uh, so, yes, there is something to it, and I don't know what it is. Okay, so that's my answer. Um, next question, Laura Schultz. Okay. Beyond Ukraine, is Putin wanting to bring other countries and regions back into the Russian fall? Is Ukraine just the beginning of Putin's plans? What a wonderful question. Yes, I mean, um, so there's some evidence, a lot more than some evidence to suggest this. As I mentioned, from 1994 onwards, he's been very interested in the Russian diaspora. So the 25 million Russians living outside the borders of the Russian Republic, the Russian Federation. So technically, he could try to gather in all those lands, right, into uh, a reconstituted Soviet Union of some sort. Um, uh, so yes, uh, and there are many Russians in Latvia, uh, but um, Putin has a special problem with the Russians living in the Baltic states um, uh, in that the Baltic states are now members of NATO. So this is a particular challenge for him. Um, the Russian army intervened in Kazakhstan in January of this year. There are many Russians in Kazakhstan as well, right? The Russian army didn't stay. Uh, so um, uh, that's interesting, that the contrast between what happened in Kazakhstan and Ukraine. Ukraine is special for the reasons that I mentioned. Uh, Putin and some of the Russians have a hard time thinking of Ukraine as an independent state. He actually dismissed Ukraine as an independent state in a speech he gave just before the invasion. So he thinks of Ukraine differently, okay, uh, for the reasons that I gave er earlier in the lecture. And also, there are still a large number of, of people who are technically Russian nationals, ethnic Russians in Ukraine, a larger number than elsewhere. Uh, so um, my answer is uh, wishy-washy. Uh, certainly, there are other countries outside Russia where Russia could intervene, but so far at least Russia is treating Ukraine as a special case. Caitlin Henrohan, can, uh, can you comment on the potential role of Transnistria? I don't know, am I butchering that, I'm sure. It, oh, that's good. That's okay. Good. Can you comment on the potential role of Transnistria in the current war? Okay, Caitlin, I knew you'd come up with a, a question like that. That's, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I'm not an expert on Transnistria. Uh, Transnistria. Um, so there's a lot of speculation that it could be used as yet another staging point for uh, Russian operations uh, from yet another angle. So Transnistria is down by Romania. Um, it's an ethnic Russian area that um, uh, was part of Moldova. This gets very complicated. Uh, there were uh, several thousand Russian troops in Transnistria. This goes back to around 1990 or so. Uh, there was a lot of fighting there. Uh, and this could potentially be used as a launching point for uh, uh, Russian operations into South Ukraine, in particular, if they decide they wanted to take the whole of the Ukrainian coastline, including Odessa, then Transnistria becomes really important strategically. Um, and also, in terms of the ethnopolitics of the war, uh, Transnistria um, could become important because of the ethnic Russian component. And South, South Russia, which... Uh, um, is has has been known as New Russia in the past. Nova Russia uh, also has a quite a large Russian population, so it could be used as kind of a um, potentially if the Russians decided they wanted to take the whole of the Ukrainian coast, uh, they could use the uh, ethnopolitics of Transnistria as a kind of um, uh, a rationalization for moving in uh, and and taking that area. Uh, so that's a, that's a partial answer to Caitlin. Unfortunately, I'm not an expert on Transnistria, so I can't really take, tell it, say more than that. Okay, I've got a question coming in, um, not on the YouTube channel, so um, but I'm going to ask it anyway. It's from Knut Peterson. Um, uh. Please um, 
Can you ask Chris about the influence of the Russian oligarchs that they may have, what influence may they have on Putin? Or do they have on Putin? Uh, okay, um, that's complicated. Um, so for many years, I've sort of assumed that um, there was a big fight, but, well, there was a big fight between the oligarchs and Putin shortly after Putin took over. Putin and Putin won. Uh, he showed the oligarchs that he was the boss. So Bill, Boris Berezovsky, who was one of the power brokers behind Yeltsin, was forced into exile, uh, went to London. Mikhail Khodorkovsky, of course, was jailed and then uh, went into exile. Uh, so oligarchs who stood up to Putin were uh, lost, uh, and they lost their, their, their fortunes as well. Uh, so the relationship since the early years of the Putin regime has been that Putin will leave the oligarchs alone in their economic realm as long as they leave leave him alone in the political realm, right? And if they dare to interfere, then that's it. Uh, uh, now, what's been happening recently is that one or two of the oligarchs have spoken out against the war uh, and have been immediately punished in some form or another. They've had their holdings confiscated, this sort of thing. But there's a subtler relationship between Putin and the oligarchs, and this is something that... Um, uh, Daniel Browder has, has really highlighted. Um, the oligarchs are the bagmen for Putin, right? So Putin, um, uh, according to Browder and others, is the richest man in the world, uh, owns $200 billion, uh, but not directly. Uh, the oligarchs are the bagmen for, for, for Putin, according to Browder and others. So they do have some sort of economic leverage over him. And um, they're certainly losing a lot in the current war, even if they are behind Putin, they're, using their, they're losing their, their yachts. One feels so sorry about that. Uh, they're losing their foreign holdings. They've lost billions and billions of dollars already. Uh, they still have, you know, they're still immensely rich men. They're almost all men. Um, because they are the bag men for Putin, they do have some leverage over him, but they haven't used it yet as far as, 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 far as we can tell. But that may come into play later on. So. Um, Leona Jacobs, what is uh, what is your take on why the Western and then in brackets NATO countries stood by why why Russia took over a Crimean Peninsula? I think that why should be a when. Um, right. Obama is in recent interviewing interviews commented on his work trying to get countries engaged in the Crimea. Okay, well, uh, what, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, we can also ask why the, the West didn't involve itself more in Syria too, right? Um, uh, um, so, uh, the Crimea, I think part of it is the audacity of what Putin did. Um, uh, people were genuinely surprised in 2014 just so that, as they were generally surprised in February of this year, right? The audacity of what Putin did, uh, not only Crimea, but the Donbass. Um, and uh, at that point, part, uh, another element of the reason was that the Ukrainians were very weak. Uh, the Ukrainian army was very weak. Ukraine was divided politically. Uh, Ukraine was not able to fight back effectively. And one of the differences between 2014 and now is that Ukraine is now fighting back very effectively. And NATO and the West are more likely to support somebody who is able to fight back than somebody who isn't, right? So this is, this is an, another part uh, of the reason, I think. Um, also, uh, I th as I said, people were surprised by the audacity uh, of what Putin did in 2014, uh, realizing that they had let him get away with it, uh, and they're much less likely to do it this time around. The scale of what's happening in 2022 is much larger as well, right? So people are literally asking, if he does this to Ukraine, uh, what may happen uh, if we're un unable to stop him? Uh, so the scale is another issue. But also, of course, in 2014, somewhat weakening the response to what the Russians did is that the Russians did have a genuine historical claim to Crimea, right? This does not mean in any sense that they should have taking it over militarily, but Crimea did belong to Russia uh, uh, in the 1950s and, and before. Uh, and uh, ethnically, um, the Crimean population, uh, I think there were many more Russians than, than Ukrainians in Crimea as well. So there, the Russians did have sort of a historical claim that by no means justifies what they did, but it did weaken the response uh, 
uh, to what they did in 2014. Okay. I've got three more questions. Are you, okay. You're okay, okay to stay yep, on? Yeah, sure. Yep, yeah. yep, yep. yep. Um, Murray Schultz, what factors or events could bring Putin to a point of negotiating peace or withdrawing? Oh, uh, well, we, we wish we knew that. <laughs> I take some heart, actually, in what he said on Victory Day. So there was all sorts of speculation about what he was going to say on Victory, on Victory Day, uh, that he was going to declare outright war on Ukraine, uh, that he was going to threaten the use of nuclear weapons. And actually, he gave a very boring speech, which I was very relieved by, right? Uh, I'm not sure he even mentioned Ukraine in his speech. He gave a 10-minute speech, which was very dull, uh, and uh, showed some introspection. We have, for many years, considered uh, Putin to be ruthless, but also calculating, to be careful. One of the shocks of February 22 was that he seemed to have w dropped that carefulness, that calculation. And the Victory Day speech seems to show an element of calculation again, that he's really thinking about uh, the implications of what he's doing. So I do take some heart from that, not very much. Uh, I do take some heart from that. What would it take for Putin to come to the negotiating table? Now, this is really difficult because um, uh, unless he is defeated abjectly, um, he probably has to be promised something. And that would involve probably keeping territory that he's taken illegally, right? Uh, and that's really, really difficult, right? How do you justify, um, you know, uh, promising somebody who has taken part of Ukraine illegally, um, a, a promise to keep it? And that's, that's, really, that's really difficult. But um, that, I would imagine at this point, that's what would be needed uh, to bring him to the negotiating table. Uh, Maureen Hawkins. Some say Putin wants to re-establish the Soviet Union. Others say that he wants to re-establish the pre-Soviet Russian Empire. What do you think? I did say the Soviet Union earlier. I misspoke. He's much more interested in the pre-Soviet Russian Empire. Putin is not a communist. Um, he is a, a Russian nationalist, and he's a, a number of other things as well, but he's not a communist. He's not interested in establish, uh, re-establishing a, a communist state. Uh, but yes, as I mentioned, the Russian Empire, with an emphasis on uh, Russians living outside the borders of, of the Russian uh, Federation, right? Um, uh, uh, there's been an indication that he wants to do that. But as I said earlier, uh, he's treating Ukraine differently than he's, than he's treating Kazakhstan, right? So there's a this special relationship with Ukraine. So it might be um, uh, the Russian Empire that limited to the current uh, Russian Federation plus parts of Ukraine, right? Eastern Ukraine and Southern Ukraine. That's possible. Okay, our last question. Uh, thanks for staying on a little bit, Chris. Um, last question is from Laura Schultz, um, and it's not an easy one. Uh, can you comment on the Arctic border, Siberia, Alaska, and Canada, and the vulnerabilities there? Oh my, okay. <laughs> uh, Th that should be a totally different SACPA session, I think. Well, um, well, you know, I, I can say something about it. You know, I have absolutely no doubt that Russian submarines regularly uh, sail into Canadian waters, and um, uh, possibly uh, we are aware of some of them, but we, we will be unaware of most of them. So I'm sure that there's a Russian presence in the Canadian Arctic already, and there has been for decades. Um, uh, it's uh, almost impossible to stop that. Um, Yes, Russia has been acting, has a very aggressive Arctic policy too. Um, I, I, I don't know in, in practical terms whether it would extend much beyond sailing submarines into Canadian waters and occasionally landing uh, Russian troops or scientists on uh, Canadian land. Um, beyond that, um, I, I don't know uh, what they would do, right? Um, but... Um, uh, yeah, I, I can't really say more than that, unfortunately. But, uh, okay. Uh, Chris, on behalf of SACPA, thank you very much. Such an intensely um, complex issue, and you really did a fantastic job to putting it into a half-hour talk. Um, okay. Many thanks from the queue. I'd like to read some to you. Um, thank you. Ian Hurdle, many thanks. <coughs> Bev, 
thank you, Chris. Great information. Maureen, thank you, Chris. This was very enlightening. Um, and Caitlin, thank you for the talk. So we've got lots of thank yous in the queue. Um, before we wrap up, do you have a take home message for our viewers? <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said before, before the talk, give peace a chance. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, this is a very dangerous situation. And um, uh, I know we all want to help Ukraine as much as possible, but um, uh, there is a, a great danger of escalation. As I said, I took some heart from Putin's victory speech. I think he's, uh, we're back to the old calculating Putin, which is a good thing. Uh, so that's my, my take home message. Give peace a chance. <laughs> we don't want to encourage too much escalation here. Uh, and there are some signs from, from Russia that uh, they don't want to do that either. Okay. Um, thank you folks for joining us, um, today. Um, join us next week for Jennifer, um, McManus. Canadian Red Cross, an overview, an update on current responses. That's next Thursday. And with that, we're going to end the live session. Thanks for joining.